So what I wanted to do today was firstly just give you some general information about the JD. Then I thought we might have a little bit of a law taster lecture. Take you back to university days if it's been a little while since you've been in a lecture theatre. Just introduce you to the way that we do things at Macquarie which we feel is in some ways different to the way that other universities um, Sorry, you're in the wrong one. You're in the wrong one? Yes. <laughs> you don't want to do a law degree? Um, not today. <laughs> not today. This is W5A. This is W5A T1. Oh, Christ the Sorry, sorry about you. Sorry. All right, so the JD itself, what is it? It is a postgraduate law degree. That is for students who already have a degree in another discipline. Three year dedicated postgraduate degree. That means that we deliver it separately from the undergraduate law program. It is dedicated for postgraduates. We are offering it on a full time basis, on a part time basis, and we're also offering the JD by distance education, and I'll explain to you a little bit about what that means in a little while. We have a flex flexible delivery method. What this means is we, we feel that the ideal student experience for postgraduate students is not coming to the law school um, or to the university for two hours every week and listening to someone like me talk in a theatre like this. We think that not so much that postgrads have better things to do, but that they ha we believe that you can plan your time better, that you can plan your study time in a way that makes it easier for you to do a law degree, a postgraduate law degree. So this means that we have substantial online content. Most of our lectures will be pre-recorded, will be delivered online through our what we call our iLearn pages. And our iLearn pages are a central hub. They're a, a content receptacle, if you like. We have, uh, we have the recording of the lectures there. We have guided readings and we have tutorial questions. We have a lot of online content. We also believe, however, that you do uh, need or benefit students, benefit from face-to-face -face interaction both with other students and with their uh, lecturers and with their tutors. But again, we like to keep this, or we're trying to keep this flexible, so what we're going to do is offer either weekly uh, seminars, or for some of our units we may offer the JD through intensive on-campus, through an intensive on-campus experience. So that means, for example, that you might come for three days of, uh, of seminars rather than the weekly delivery. And certainly this is the case for the distance education students. They're not expected to be on campus every week. Our distance education students come for intensive on-campus sessions, uh, usually once per semester. We are offering the JD with the possibility of specialising in different areas of law. Our law school, Macquarie Law School, is very, very strong in environmental law and international environmental law, in commercial law, um, and also in social justice, in issues of, of social justice. So these will be specialisations that will be available. Well, on to the nuts and bolts of the, the degree itself. You're probably aware that the JD is one of the elements that you would need to satisfy in order to become eligible to practice as a legal uh, practitioner in New South Wales, whether you want to practice as a solicitor or a barrister or an in-house counsel um, or any other um, profession in which a law degree is, is necessary. It's only one element. There are some other elements of becoming a lawyer. That is, you need also to do some practical legal training. This is offered by institutions such as the College of Law. And then the rest of your training is on the job training, gaining the experience that you need to then eventually practice on your own account. We're looking into the possibility that our JD will satisfy cross-jurisdictional admission rules. Now, for example, let's say you've done a, do a law degree in another country. In, I've had a couple of applications from the UK, from Italy, from the United States, and you want to practice law in Australia. Well, our current admission authority, that is the Legal Profession Admission Board, will require you to take a number of, uh, update your degree in, in, uh, in some areas. 
Well, it's the same with the JD. If you have do a JD in Australia, does that mean you can practice worldwide? Not immediately, but it does mean that you will probably feel, fulfil some of the requirements for cross-jurisdictional admission in other countries, should you decide that you want to practice in, uh, in another jurisdiction. All right, why would, you come, why would you come to Macquarie to do your law degree, your JD de um, degree? There are lots and lots of JDs around. Well, we feel that the Macquarie degree is, is different. We've got a very long history in the law degree of studying law in what we call a contextual and interdisciplinary manner. We don't just look at the law. You won't come to Macquarie and learn that oh, section 232 of the Corporations Code tells you this or that Section 12 of the Conveyancing Act tells you something else. I mean, it's, what's the point of that? It's useless. The, the, the students to whom I taught insurance law last year, this time last year, in 2012, their knowledge is already out of date. Why? Because the law changed in July this year. So what we like to do at Macquarie is we look at the law from a number of different perspectives. We look, we like to teach our, chil uh, our children, our students, how to discover what the law is, rather than what it is at this minute. They discover how it, how it came to be enacted the way it did, whether it's likely to change, whether it should change. And we'll look at a couple of areas in a minute when we do our, our taster law degree. We have, as I've said, expertise in distance education and online delivery. Macquarie Law School has been offering a distance education LLB, an undergraduate law degree, for many years. We have, uh, we've trained a lot of lawyers that way. And we're going to continue this mode of delivery with the JD. Now distance education doesn't mean entirely uh, <laughs> that you ne would never visit the campus because we feel that in order to develop all of those other skills that we're concentrating on in the JD, that you do need to come on, on campus. You need to interact with the other students, you need to talk to your tutors. However, the large part of the JD can be delivered by distance education. At Macquarie we have a student orientated focus. We, we like to get to know our students. We like to interact, interact with our students. We like our students to be part of their own education. We don't like this, this model of me standing up here and talking to you or at you, as uh, some people would think. We like you to, as students to get involved, to develop your own skills of communication, of being able to walk into a meeting and run a meeting, to deliver your own uh, talks about law, um, your talks about all sorts of things that you might have to do in either business or in, your, in further education. This means that we have an emphasis on developing not just a whole bank of legal knowledge that you may have, but we also have the emphasis on developing skills and on developing your ability to research law, your ability to find what the law is, and your ability to decide what the law should be. The law doesn't descend on us from, from above. The law is developed by real people. It's through policy development. It's through people deciding what the law should be. And as lawyers, we should be involved in that process. We should be thinking about whether our laws are right or wrong. We should be thinking about how our laws conflict with other areas. And at Macquarie, this is, this is what we do. We like to develop these skills of analysis, of critique, of communication, and uh, we, we do this in, on top of teaching what the legal doctrine is. Part of the JD emphasises independent research and this is what sets it apart really from the undergraduate law programs. As postgraduates, the JD students have all done another degree, so you're all pretty on top of what it, what it, what's involved in, in doing a degree. So we feel that now in the JD it's time to develop your skills of independent research, of being able to direct your own learning in a way that, that suits you best. Another important part of the JD is what we call PACE or participation and community involvement and just as with our undergraduate degrees in the JD you'll have the opportunity to integrate your law learning into a workplace. Now there are all sorts of PACE opportunities, participation opportunities in the JD. You can for example be placed in one of the legal centres 
in the Macquarie Legal Centre, in the Public Interest Advocacy Centre, but we also have some really, really exciting international PACE opportunities. For example, over Christmas this, this year, we're offering our students the opportunity to go to Cambodia and there are many, many opportunities there. Some of them will be sitting on the war trials, trials uh, tribunals. Some of them will be helping in communi community legal centres. There's all sorts of, of opportunities of that type. So th this is what the Macquarie JD is all about. This is how we want to deliver it. But what I thought I might do now is, is just give you a short taster of the Macquarie method of, of delivering a legal education. So I thought I'd pick some some questions that we can try and get some answers to. At the end I'll let you ask, there'll be time for questions about the, the delivery model and all of that, but let's just have a little look at, at what we do at Macquarie, how we, how we like to deliver our legal education. So here's a burning question for you. Can I sell one of my kidneys to pay for my law degree? It's a legal question. Can I? I can't at the moment. Not, uh, not realistic? Well, we'll see. Another question, this is, this is a, a, something that we look at in property law and we'll, we'll have a, a little look at this issue in just a moment. Secondly, from equity and trusts, why does the Church of Scientology enjoy tax-free status in Australia? What is it about our legal definition of charity that means that Scientology is a charity, whereas an institution such as Amnesty International is not, because Amnesty tries to change the law? There's, in the United States, there are some class actions at the moment that say that are being brought against companies such as McDonald's and Wendy's and other fast food providers. Class actions that are being brought in tort for injury caused to a whole generation of children who are becoming obese because they're, they're being lured, or so the argument goes, they're being lured into, into demanding that their parents feed them Big Macs and Wendy's burgers, these sorts of things. Well, is this a valid legal claim? It certainly was against the cigarette companies, wasn't it? Similar sort of thing. Um, a company was injuring a generation of people by luring them into smoking. Uh, there are other examples of this as well. And, and this, is a, this is an area of research of one of our academics in the law school, um, Penelope Watson, is looking at this whole area of obesity research. A, a, a next, a, a, another question, why is Tony Abbott our Prime Minister? Why isn't he King Tony? Horrible thoughts, some people might say, <laughs> but why isn't he President Tony? We have three countries all with the same history, don't we? The UK, America and Australia. We all have slightly different methods of electing our leaders. Why is that? Why do we have the one that we do? Would you like to change it? Could we appoint our own monarchy, start our own monarchy? Would we start with the Abbott family if we did? So the, these are questions that come through constitutional law and uh, Dr Ian Stewart or Associate Professor Ian Stewart looks at that when he looks at constitutional law. Another burning issue, am I breaking the law if I buy a fake Louis Vuitton handbag at the markets. I can't afford a real one, so should I be allowed to have that fake one? Well again, the answer is no, I'm offending someone's intellectual property rights. But again, at Macquarie we would look at this conflict between intellectual property rights of the creators of these goods and other rights such as human rights, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second as well. Right, let's, let's just briefly dig into this first question a little bit further. This question about whether or not I, I could sell one of my kidneys if I wanted to pay for my law degree. All right. Well, this man certainly thought that he was entitled to get some recompense for the, he didn't sell one of his kidneys, but he gave it to his wife. He donated one of his kidneys to his wife. Now they're getting divorced and he wants it back or he wants to be paid for it. He wants to be recompensed and he's claiming that his kidney is worth $1.5 million in the property settlement between himself and his wife. We laugh, don't we? We say this is a bit silly really, isn't it? But why is it silly? And what is the legal situation here? Can he get it back? No, he can't. Can he be recompensed for it? Does this depend on whether or not it was his property? 
Do you feel as if your kidneys are your property? Yes, would you be surprised to find that in fact they're not? That you don't own them in the traditional sense of owning property? It's an interesting question, isn't it? We look at this in property law. Um, well, Dr. Bat uh, Batista, unfortunately, didn't get his, his kidney back, nor did he get his $1.5 million. But what of these men? What of these men? If the true value of a, of a kidney is $1.5 million, then these men have been shortchanged. Because, according to a news report, there has been a billion dollar kidney bazaar in Pakistan. There is something like, or there were something like 500 transplant tourists a month going to Pakistan um, each year to receive a kidney that was sold to them by a local. They would pay about $27,000 for their kidney. And these donors were mostly poor villagers who would use the sale of the, the proceeds of the sale of their kidney to set them up for life. All right, it's the same issue, isn't it? It's the same issue. Is the kidney property? If it is, is it the property of these men to sell? But all of a sudden we're in conflict with a different area, aren't we? We're in conflict with issues of poverty and oppression and human rights and equity and justice. And for a question that sounded a little bit flippant, I suppose, when I first asked it, that is, can we sell our kidney or a cornea or something else to pay for something that we really want? All of a sudden you can see that at Macquarie we now look at it from a number of different perspectives. And we look at it from not just the legal perspective, the answer is no, you can't sell your kidney. But all of a sudden we've looked at all of these other areas as well. About, um, about the conflict with human rights. Just another example that I quite like. Have any of you taken a Bikram yoga class? Anyone taken, done Bikram yoga? Well, um, this also is another example of a form of property, surprisingly enough. You may um, be aware that for many years, the creator of Bikram yoga, Bikram Chowdhury, has jealously and, and litigiously protected his sequence of 26 yoga poses and the, the 40 odd page dialogue that goes along with it. If you've done a Bikram yoga class anywhere in the world, you'll know that the teachers are not permitted to stray even by one word from the dialogue that Bikram Chowdhury developed for his classes. He's protected this as a form of intellectual property. What do you think about this? He has hijacked a very ancient tra tradition, the tradition of yoga, and he's grabbed a bit of it and, and tried to claim it as his own. Well, in the uh, United States courts, as you can see there, um, it was finally, after 10 years of lawsuits, decided that Bikram Chowdhury's copyright on his specific sequence of Bikram yoga um, was not protectable under the law. All right, that's copyright. Another issue, the, the Louis Vuitton hate handbag is also to do with copyright, about claiming intellectual property rights. Another example would be my right as the author of a textbook, let's say to claim my intellectual property rights in a book that I wrote. Do we all feel that that's fair enough? That I, I mean, it took me two years to write, should I be paid for that? What about if my book is being distributed in, in China, let's say, for example, where students can't afford to pay the $150 that it costs. Do we then have a different issue because my right, my property right, is now in conflict with human rights. The human rights of students to have the education that I was able to get um, basically for nothing, free access to, to, to some forms of education. But now these children have no such rights and couldn't afford it even if they did. So again, we're in conflict in the, United, in the United Kingdom. There's been a conflict between the rights of owners of real property in conflict with the rights of homeless people who otherwise have nowhere to live. Well, whose rights, whose rights should win in that situation? This is just a small taster of what we mean by an interdisciplinary or a contextual look at law. It's just a couple of examples from, from areas in, what, in, in which I teach. I think they're particularly interesting. You'll notice that I didn't mention criminal law, because firstly because I know nothing about it, and also because you know all you need to know about criminal law from watching the television, don't you? So we don't need to worry about that in this course. 
So that's just a very small taster of a Macquarie approach to, to looking at law. You can see it's not just about learning sections of acts or about learning what the law is today. It's a particular way of looking at law, of, of thinking about law in its relationship to other disciplines, to other rights. And this is, uh, this is what we'll be doing in the JD.